Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your Source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 51 for the 10th of Shvat and a leap year. And I thought I should mention that in Chabad circles, the 10th of Shvat is a pretty big day. This is the day in which the Rebbe, uh, the seventh Rebbe of Lubavitch, accepted the leadership of the movement. So it's a big day of celebration, you know, and it's thought of as sort of like the beginning of this new generation of Chassidus and of, you know, the, the Rebbe's reign and all of that. So thought I'd mention that. And now we'll get into the Tanya. So today's Tanya we uh, is going to be fairly long. We're doing a, an entire chapter. So we'll get into it. But before we get into it, as something that I'd like to bring up, which is sort of like a topic that's going to be addressed, is actually Sigmund Freud and a theory that he had called Thanatos. And Thanatos is the Greek word for death. So Freud had this, so originally he actually had this theory of eros, which was the life instinct, he called it. And he said that humans, and this was something that was commonly understood by many different philosophers and, and psycho- psychiatrists and psychologists, that there's a certain drive for life that motivates a lot of behavior. And this is what leads us to want to mate with other people, to cooperate with other people, and to survive, all of these things. But what what Freud started to notice in his research is he he felt through researching different behaviors of people that there's another instinct. There's an instinct towards death. And he called this thanatos, which is the Greek word for death. And he said that this manifests in people through aggression, through risky behavior, like doing things that are really dangerous, and through reliving trauma. So, uh, So this is, you know, and he explains a lot of human behavior in this light that he said that it's not so simple that humans want to survive. They actually, there is a certain part of us that actually wants to die. (laughs) So today we're going to look at all of this through the lens of Tanya and try to understand what exactly are these human instincts? Do we actually have a death instinct? Do we have a life instinct? What is it all about? And we'll actually come to a much deeper understanding of all of this. And just to kind of give like a little bit of a, a, teaser into this is what we'll begin to learn is that uh, the drive to want to escape from the materiality of the world, which Freud may have thought of as a death instinct, actually could be stemming from something much deeper than that, which the Tanya will actually call the life instinct once we understand what true life is. So while, you know, maybe aggression and risky behavior are not positive manifestations of this instinct, there is something there to the human being wanting to, especially a Jew, wanting to escape the boundaries of the physical world and physical reality in recognition that this is not the true reality, but the way that the Tanya refers to this is not as a death instinct, but it's actually a life instinct and will explain how this is and what what this is all about. So let's get into the text. So it's so the altar of us starts off by saying, kind of alluding to the fact that this is going to be a continuation from what we've been learning so far, which was, if you remember yesterday's episode and what we've been talking about recently, you can go back obviously and listen to those if you haven't already, is we've been talking about this this hidden love that's innate and given to us as an inheritance in every Jew, this hidden love of God that we all possess. And so the Ultra Rebbe begins this chapter, 19, and he says, 
in to continue this elucidation of this idea of this hidden innate love of God that every Jew possesses, we must clarify very well that which it says, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam. So this is a verse from Mishlei, chapter 20, verse 27, which literally means the candle of God is the soul of man. And what this means is that Jewish people, Israel, who are called man, their soul is like the light of a candle. So what does a candle do? What does the flame of a candle do? If you ever look at a flame of a candle, it's not static, right? It's flickering, it's swaying back and forth, and it's moving upwards. And this is the nature of the flame, is to flicker like this and move upwards. Why? Because the light of the, fa of the, the fire, it's yearning by nature is to actually be detached from the wick. So it's trying to detach itself from the wick and to connect to its source above in the element of fire, the general element of fire that's underneath the sphere of the moon. And the ultra says this is elucidated upon further in the It's Chaim, which is a Kabbalistic book. And even though this, if it were to actually, you know, disconnect from the wick, this would cause it to extinguish and it wouldn't be able to light up anything it wouldn't be able to illuminate anymore below and even up above it wouldn't not only would it not be able to illuminate below but even above in its source it would actually become nullified its light would become nullified in its source um, but nevertheless even though this is the case that it would become totally extinguished down here and nullified above above this is its nature to want to rise back up to its source and separate from the wick. So just like this, the Alter Rebbe says, this is just like the soul of man, meaning the soul of a Jew. And also the, and the, and he specifies the neshama, which again is like, so if you remember the soul is divided up into three parts, the neshama, ruach, and the nefesh. So he says, this is the nature of the neshama. And this is also the nature of the ruach and the ne nature of the nefesh. So all aspects of the soul, their yearning and their desire by nature is actually to leave the body and to return back to its source in God, which is the source of all life. Even though what this will mean is that it will become not, not and nothingness and will become totally nullified in its source. And there won't be anything left of it at all in terms of its original existence. Nevertheless, this is its actual will by nature. So this seems to indicate that maybe there was something to Freud's theory, right? This uh, innate desire that we all have, the altar was saying, for our souls to leave our body, even though that would mean that we would actually become extinguished and no longer exist the way that we think of ourselves as existing. But let's read a little further and we'll see that it's actually not so simple. So the ultra now says that this, when we say nature, that this is its nature, then he says that this, this word nature, we use it as a, a term. This is a term that we use for anything that is not rational. And so what this means is that this desire of the soul is not something which is rational. So it's not a rational thing that we want to detach from our bodies and return back to our source and God. So it's actually above knowledge and above rationality, above understanding. And this is the aspect of the chokhmah that is in the nefesh. So this is, remember this chokhmah that we talked about. We talked about this yesterday more. Again, you can listen to that there for a review. This intuition, you know, you can call it, or wisdom. It's hard to translate these terms properly, but it's we, it's chokhmah in Hebrew. And this chokhmah contains within it, because remember we talked about the chokhmah is the chokhmah, the power of what? It is the, the conduit by which it transmits the light of the Ein Sof. So it's it's really, so this power of, you know, this uh, this nature that we all have to uh, of our souls to detach from the body and return to their source, this isn't coming from a rational place. That's what the altar was saying. It's coming from a super rational place. It's coming from the chokhmah, not from the intellect, not from understanding or knowledge. And now the altar says that this is a general rule that we can say about anything that comes from the side of a holiness, that it is that it comes from chokhmah. Why? Because chokhmah is called kodesh ha'elyon. This is supernal holiness, which is nullified in its source in the light of the Ein Sof Lorchu, in the light of the of infinite God, which is vested within it. And it's not something on its own. 
of its own right. And this is why, again, this is why it's called koach ma, which means the power of what, which is the exact opposite of the klipa and the sitra ahra, the other side that we talked about, that through from which the, the souls of the nations of the world and that they, you know, they, they just work for themselves, the Altarba says, and they're always taking, taking, and, and it, there's a lot of ego there. And they think of themselves as being something substantial in their own right. So this is the exact opposite of Chochmah. And so this is why, so now here's where it gets, we're going to understand this in a deeper way, that actually that those people that think of themselves as having an existence in their own right, they are actually called dead. Because it says, Ki This is a verse from Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 12. Meaning that, and chokma, this wisdom, will vivify, will give life. And then the Altar Rebbe cites another verse, this time from Eov, from Job, chapter 4, verse 21, where it says, Yamutu velobe chokma, that they will die, but not with chokma. So this is the reality of those people who are not Jewish, who don't serve God, you know, who are idolaters. And really anything that's on the other side, that's in, you know, the Sitra Ahra, as we call it, or the Klipos, they are actually called dead because, ironically, or maybe paradoxically, because they actually give so much value to their own self and they think they have this illusion of having their own identity, this actually makes them dead. And then the Altar Abba says that this applies also to even those wicked and sinners amongst Israel before they come to this test, so to to sanctify God's name. So remember we learned about how every single Jew will actually pass this test of, you know, not being able to to give up their Judaism when push comes to shove because every single Jew has within them this innate love. And sometimes it's like they need this test to bring it out where somebody actually has to challenge their Jew- Jewishness in some way, you know, by telling them throughout history, you know, to bow down to an idol or renounce their Judaism or something like that. But before they're brought into this kind of test, then they still do f- fall into this category of not really being fully alive because the aspects of Chochmah that's in the godly soul that uh, uh, together with this spark of godliness that comes from the infinite God, which is invested within them because every single Jew does have this invested within them, is, is found in exile in their bodies inside of the animal soul because of the klipa that is found in the left ventricle of the heart, as we spoke about before, which is actually ruling over their bodies right now. In the secret of the galus shechina as we talked about of the exile of the shechina so basically so what it's saying is that for some jews unfortunately you know who have fallen into sin and transgression and wickedness so for them it's not that they don't have the spark of godliness within them they very much do but it's actually within exiled within them and it's trapped inside of their animal soul because that animal soul has dominion and within them and, and not the godly soul. And this is why, says the Altar Rebbe, this love that we're talking about that's found within the, the godly soul, whose utmost desire and yearning is to cleave to God, who is the life of all life, is called a hidden love because it's hidden and it's covered up in this this uh, this covering of a sackcloth of, of the klipa in the sinners of Israel. And this is how they're able to have this spirit of folly enter into them to allow them to sin. And now here the Altarba cites a quote from the Gemara in Sota, page 3a, where it says, So a person does not sin unless a spirit of folly enters into them. Because if somebody was, if a Jew is totally in tune with who they really are and they were not living in this like exiled state and there was no, no covering of their godly soul in this way, they would never sin. So the only way that a Jew is able to sin and to enter into this like insanity that would lead them to do something that's against God's will is because this love of God that they have within them is trapped within these klipos that are that's hiding it within it and so the altar says that it's in a way of sleeping within the Rashaim, within these wicked people and so it's not doing its job every time that they are engaged in the taivos in the desires of the world it's they're they're keeping it asleep. They're not letting it wake up. And this is true up until the point where they do come to a place of an isayon, when they come to a place of a test. 
in terms of faith, which is something which is above reason. And this will touch when we get to this level, which is above reason, because this whole aspect of this, this faith in God and this love of God is something which is above reason. Having a test like this that goes over and above reason is going to touch this aspect of their soul, which is the aspect of Chochmah. And this will cause it to finally wake up from its slumber, and it's going to do its job with the power of God, which is vested within it. And the Altar Rebbe cites a verse from Tehillim, chapter 78, verse 65, where it says, which literally means that, and God wakes him up out, as if out of slumber. So it's like, finally, you know, this person is waking up out of their slumber when they're challenged in this kind of way, kind of way. And this is why we can see that there is this way that the person will be able to up to stand against this test in terms of his faith in God without any reason. So it's not a rational thing. Like when you've had these stories of these martyrs throughout Jewish history, even if they weren't necessarily the most religious Jews, it was not a rational thing that was going on. It was something that was over and above reason. And this specifically this point of it being being because it was over and above reason it was touching on a much deeper place than reason and this ha gave them the ability to be able to overcome the klipos and the desires of this world whether it's something permissible or something forbidden and that they were you know very habituated within them and they all of a sudden in a split second they hate these things and they actually choose god when push comes to sho shove every single jew will choose god is what the altar is saying and will choose his portion and his fate to give over his life for sanctifying in the name of God. And this is true even if, you know, throughout their life, the Klipos actually took hold of them and were in charge over them. And they had no power over them. As it says that, so that the evil people are in the power of their heart that's from Breshish Rabbah 3411 so meaning to say that for Rishayim they are totally subservient to their heart like their heart rules over them they don't actually have control over their heart so the way that other people do so we, we've talked about that previously nevertheless even these kind of people who have become so habituated and to not to go against the will of God and are totally subservient to their heart when push comes to shove when they come into this kind of test when it comes to in terms of their faith in one God, whose source is in the highest of the height of holiness, which is translates into the chokhmah that is in the godly soul, in which the light of God, the infinite God resides, then all of the klipos become nullified to this. And it's as if they never existed at all. And the altar says that there's a verse in Yeshayahu, uh, chapter 40, 17, that alludes to this, where it says, Kol goyim ke ein negdol v'gomer, that all the goyim, all the other nations are like nothing before him. So it's like they just totally become nullified. Any any force that's that goes against God becomes totally and utterly nullified in that time. And he cites another verse, this time from Tehillim, chapter 92, verse 10, which he, which also alludes to this idea where it says, that here are your enemies, God. Here are your enemies, and they will be lost, and they will fall apart. And similarly, in Tehillim, chapter 68, verse 3, it says, that it means just like wax melts before fire, this is how they too will be dispersed. And again, in Tehillim, chapter 27, verse 5, it says, that the, the, the mountains will melt like wax. And so now the altar says that this light of God, which is vested within the Chochmah that is in the Nefesh, is so great. Its power is so great that it can actually push away the Sitra Achra and the Klipos so that they will not be able to even touch his clothing. His, the garments of his soul, which is, again, if you to reiterate, is the machshava dibor and maise, the thought, speech, and action of the faith in God, in one God, meaning to be able to step, withstand any test, to be able to give up their life, to not go against God in any type of action at all. That any, like, so meaning to say that this, this power, this force that we have within us of 
this internal faith of God, this hidden faith of God that comes from the Chokhmah is so strong that it can push aside the Klipos and the Sitra Akhra when, you know, when there's this test that comes about that will allow a person to withstand a test and not do any kind of action that goes against God. So for example, he gives a very practical example to bow down before an idol. So we've had stories of this throughout history where, you know, people were told to bow before a cross or whatever it was. And, and Jews actually gave up their lives for this even if they didn't actually believe in it in, in their heart. So even just to do it in action, a Jew will refuse to do this. So even if they will say in their heart, oh, I don't really believe this, so I'm just going to like do it on the outside, even in the garment of action, they will this this power of this innate love that comes from Chochmah will not allow a person to, will, will be strong enough to be able to, um, to help them withstand it even in action, even if it's not going to translate into their emotions in their mind and so too it has this power to prevent them from in speech to speak against god and to speak against the oneness of god even if let's say he's saying these things and he doesn't actually believe them in his heart and so even if you know let's say within his heart he believes fully in god and has this inner faith in god a such a Jew, when brought to this test, will have the power to not even speak against the word of God, even if he doesn't believe it in his heart. And this, the Alter Rebbe says, is what we call the fear that is encompassed within love, which is this inner love, this innate love that is in the godly soul that is in all Jewish people whose sole desire within their nature is to attach and cleave to their source in the light of the Ein Sof because of this love and this will for anything having to do with God. And the way that this will manifest in fear is that this will cause a person to fear anything by nature that even is like the slightest tip of, of impurity of a Vodazara, of idol worship, God forbid, which is against the faith in, in one God, even in an ex external garments, which is speaking or action without any kind of belief within one's heart at all. So that's the end of the chapter. So just to recap all of this, just to give a brief, brief recap and bring it back to the beginning. So was Freud right? <laughs> so not really. He, you know, Freud said that, you know, there's this death wish that everybody has. So what it, it's possible, I'm not sure. You know, Freud was a Jew after all. So he, <laughs> he also had this innate love of God and, you know, this deep intuition and everything. So he may have been tapping into this idea that, yes, by nature, every single Jew actually has this desire, like a flame, to go back to its source, which is outside the body, which is ultimately within God himself. However, what the Ultra Rebbe explains and how he clarifies this is this is actually not, not death at all. This is actually the complete opposite of death. This is actually life and true life. And death actually is the complete opposite. Death is when a person actually just gives in to the desires of the world and thinks of themselves as a being in, the, in their own right and gets further and further into their ego and into themselves. And in fact, true life is in this desire and innate drive that we all have to cleave to God. And the altar Rebbe says that ultimately this desire, this innate love that we all have of God and this innate want that we have to yearn to this yearning that we have to cleave to God and to actually even want to nullify ourselves within God is actually so deep and so innate within every single Jew that even a Jew who has strained so far away from God and doesn't keep mitzvahs and is, you know, thought of to call this a wicked person, a transgressor, even for them, this love is innately within them and is the deepest part of who they are. And even though it may be sleeping and it may be in exile most of their lives, when push comes to shove, when they're, such a Jew is brought to a test that really will challenge their innate Judaism and challenge this innate faith that they have of God, they have the power to rise to this test. And they have the power to rise to this test to the point that not only will they not internally accept this fact that there isn't one God and, you know, there's an idol or whatever it is, or they're not Jewish or, you know, whatever it is, this test will actually bring it out so that they will not, they, they have the power to be able to overcome this renouncing of God in speech or in action, even if it doesn't translate into their hearts. And as I've mentioned before, maybe nowadays we don't have this situation of, you know, the Spanish Inquisition telling us to bow down to idols or whatever it is, but we do find a very curious phenomenon even nowadays that 
Jews, no matter who they are, no matter how secular they are, no matter how quote unquote far they seem from being Jewish, when push comes to shove, if you actually ask them, are you Jewish time and time again, for the most part, they will say yes, and they will refuse to renounce their Judaism and they will stand up to being Jewish. And you'll find that, you know, unfortunately, um, it, it takes anti-Semitism sometimes to bring this out for Jews to, uh, to come into solidarity, Jews from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, they will realize that they are Jewish. And this is, you know, it's not to give an excuse for anti-Semitism or something like that, but sometimes when we become so comfortable in exile and so comfortable in our environment, we could actually, a Jew could actually forget about this innate love that they have. And that part of them that is Jewish could go into this and, and that believes in God in this really strong way, could be in a slumber, could be in exile. And sometimes it will take these, these anti-Semitic forces, unfortunately, to actually bring out this proclaiming of Jewish pride. And you'll find this, that often, you know, like if you look in France, for example, or in Montreal, where I grew up, this these are places which unfortunately have a lot of anti-Semitism, but what you'll find there, in addition to that, is a lot of Jewish pride. And I my theory behind that is because when you're faced with such opposition as a Jew, this will stir up this inner Jewish pride that you have within you. Whereas, you know, maybe here in America, this is less pronounced because we don't have this anti-Semitism, which is a good thing you know or at least it's not in a, a, as overt a way this the level of anti-semitism it's not as in your face so that's a good thing on, on the one hand on the other hand it doesn't really give jews the opportunity to have this test to manifest their true innate faith and and love and desire to cleave and to become one with god so i'm not saying that there should be more anti-semitism here to bring that out now none of us should really be tested in this way or need to be led to this test but what we can take away from what we've learned today in today's tanya is just this idea that whether a jew is conscious of it or not we all do have this innate faith in god and in god's oneness and this innate desire to cleave to god and to actually become nullified within his essence. And this is not at all, God forbid, a death wish. This is actually a, le a life wish. And this is our ultimate life because God is the ultimate life of all of us. So I hope that was, that, you know, that, that clarified some things for you. And tomorrow we'll continue and we'll move on to chapter 20. I'll speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.